in these days, when we see the America that once was imploding, self-destructing, what do you and I need to remember, beloved? We need to remember this, that the purposes of God stand. What God has purposed, he will perform. And you and I are to make him the habitation of our righteousness. beloved, because God is God and because God purposes and there is a day and there is an hour and there is a time when those purposes will be fulfilled. You and I need to learn how to run and make him, as Isaiah 50 verse 7 says, the habitation of our righteousness. In other words, this is where we run in the days when we see everything crumbling and falling apart. We need to know that what God has purposed will come to pass. I love Isaiah chapter 14, and I want us to use that as our theme as we study the last and final chapters of Jeremiah. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 24. The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely as I have intended, so it has happened. And just as I have planned, so it will stand. And then you drop down to verse 27. For the Lord of hosts has planned, and who can frustrate it? As for his outstretched arm, who can turn God's arm back? Certainly no one, because God is sovereign. Now, in this week, you and I are going to cover I, uh, Jeremiah chapter 50, 51, and 52. You say, that doesn't sound like a big deal. If you're saying that, then I know that you have not done your advanced homework. I know that you did not download this study, or if you did, you didn't get into it, because those are whoppers of chapters. And as you know, when we study a book of the Bible, I take you through it verse by verse. You get the study guide. You need to get online at preceptsforlife.com if God's purposes stand and what he has promised will come to pass, that he will perform it, then you and I need to know the word of God. If he's going to be the habitation of our righteousness so that when we uh, uh, don't know what to do, uh, we run to him and we find out that he tells us this is the way, walk in it, then we've got to know his word. So you keep studying with me. Now, let's look at Jeremiah chapter 50. The word which uh, the Lord spoke concerning Babylon the land of the Chaldeans. Now, we have seen that Babylon and Chaldea are, in, in essence, one and the same. And this is what he says through Jeremiah the prophet. Now, what we are about to see is we are about to see Jeremiah's final prophecy about the nations. Remember in Jeremiah 1, he says, I have appointed you as a prophet to the nations, and you are going to tear down, you are going to root up, you are going to destroy, or you are going to build and you are going to plant. Now, what we saw as we looked at the nations in the chapters just previous to this, some of the nations he tore down, he uprooted, and he destroyed, but he promises a recovery. When we get to Babylon, we see Babylon uh, in, in such detail that it almost blows your mind, and you understand, hey, there is something very significant about Babylon, and there is. And this is what I want you to see. 
in, I, in Jeremiah chapter 50 and 51, we're going to look at what God says about Babylon. In Jeremiah 52, which will be on the last day, we're going to look at what God says about Jerusalem. We're going to look at the final destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon. And yet, what you and I need to do is we need to take this and put it in the context of the whole. All the way through the Bible, there are two major cities. And those two cities appear in the Torah in the first five books of the Bible. The first one to appear is Babel, the city of Babel, where uh, Nimrod decides that he is going to uh, uh, stand against the Lord. We're going to go into that. The second city we see God talking about in Deuteronomy when he tells them you're going into the land and when you go into the land, I'm going to show you where I'm going to put my name. And where he puts his name is in the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, who is also mentioned in, in uh, seed form in Genesis. In Genesis, where Abraham is fighting against these kings and the king of Salem, Melchizedek, comes out and he, Abraham, pays tithes to him. Melchizedek, king of Salem, Salem, Jerusalem, and it means peace. So all the way through the Bible, there are two major cities, Babylon and Jerusalem. And if you will keep that in mind, because it takes us all the way through the word of God to the final chapters, to the final book of the Bible. We've gone from Genesis. Now we go to Revelation. Genesis is the book of beginnings. It's Bereshit is the name of it. And it means beginnings. And we come to Revelation, which is the unveiling of, of God's work and God coming and taking over the earth. And in uh, Revelation chapter 17 and 18, also in, in Revelation chapter 16 at the end of it, in Revelation chapter uh, 14, you have mentions of Babylon. Now, if you're going to understand what God says about Babylon, because we're on this side of the cross, you and I then are able to look back, look back from Revelation, which tells us about the end and God's purposes being accomplished. And we're able to look clear back to the book of Jeremiah and understand Jeremiah 50 and 51 like they were unable to understand it. Now, the main, the main teaching on Babylon, the main teaching on the future of Babylon is found in Isaiah chapter 13 and 14 in the book of Isaiah. And, and, and it begins in 13 and 14 and then at the end of Jeremiah. So this is the main teaching. So you really want to understand it. All right, now let me read to you. The word of the Lord, uh, the word which the Lord spoke concerning Babylon, the land of the Chaldeans through Jeremiah the prophet. Declare and proclaim among the nations. Proclaim it and lift up a standard. Do not conceal it, but say, Babylon has been captured. Babylon has been captured. Babylon the Great, Babylon the head of gold as, as uh, Daniel 2 explains. Babylon has been captured. Oh, yes. It says, Bel has been put to shame. Marduk has been shattered. Those are their idols. Her images have been put to shame. Her idols have been shattered. For a nation has come up against her out of the north. It will make her land an object of horror. There will be no inhabitant in it. Both man and beast have wandered off. They've just wandered off. They, they, they've gone away. 
in those days and at that time, and this is absolutely key for understanding what we're reading, and I'm going to explain it to you. But in those days and at that time, you want to mark it, it's a time phrase, declares the Lord, the sons of Israel will come, both they and the sons of Judah. So the sons of Israel, let's say this is Babylon over here. I mean, just think of, of my left side as Babylon, my right side as, as Jerusalem. And so it's saying the sons of Israel and the sons of Judah as well will come. They will go along weeping as they go, and it will be the Lord, their God, they will seek. They will ask, which way to Zion? For the way to Zion, turning their faces in its direction. They will come that they might join themselves to the Lord in an everlasting covenant that will not be forgotten. My people have become like lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray. They have gone, they have made them turn aside on the mountains. They have gone along from mountain to hill and have forgotten their resting place. My shepherds, my shepherds, my ungodly shepherds kept my people away from my land and away from my blessings. And then he says, all who came upon them have devoured them and their adversaries have said, we are not guilty in as much as they. And you want to put a star of David there so that you understand. He's talking about Israel in as much as they have sinned against the Lord. Now here it is. Who is the habitation of righteousness? Who is the habitation of righteousness? What does that mean? It means if you want to live right, if you want to know how you are to behave, how you are to have a family, how you are to have a business, how you are to be as a parent, how you are to be as a child, how you are to be as a child of God, how you're to deal with people, how you're to love people, etc. God is the habitation of your righteousness. You come to God and you say, but how do I come to God? You come to God through his word. You come to God through his word and hear these are the words of righteousness. These are the precepts of life, the standards by which we live, the commands and, 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 and the will of God and the mind of God and the heart of God and the character of God. So he is the habitation of righteousness. We'll talk about it in just a minute. The nations, welcome back, excuse me, I'm excited, we got lots to cover. The nations that have been devouring Israel have said, well, they've sinned against the Lord. They have sinned against the one who is the habitation of righteousness. Jeremiah 50 verse 7, even the Lord, the hope of their fathers. Now listen. These are perilous days in which we are living. Things are not the same as they were, and I don't think they're going to be the same. So as we look at what God says, you and I have to take these principles and these precepts, and we have to put them into our lives so that we, in turn, can have God as the habitation of our righteousness. Now watch what he's saying. Wander away from the midst of Babylon. Go forth from the land of, Cal of the Chaldeans. He's talking still to his people, Israel. He says, get out of there. Wander away from the midst of Babylon. Go forth from the land of the Chaldeans. Be also like male goats at the head of the flock. Hey, you lead the pack. He says, for behold, I am going to arouse and bring up against Babylon, a horde of great nations from the land of the north. You say, what is this? Well, hang on. And they will draw up their battle lines against her. And from there, she, 
Babylon will be taken captive. Now, if you're studying along with us, and I hope that you're going deeper and getting that wonderful study guide that we have that takes you deeper so that you really learn for yourself. But one of the things we told you to do is mark every reference to Babylon so that you understand who the hers are and, and everything. So he's talking about Babylon. And it says, they will draw up in battle lines against her. Their arrows would be like an expert warrior who does not return empty-handed. Chaldea will be plundered. Chaldea will be plundered, and all who plunder her will have enough. In other words, there's going to make many spoils, declares the Lord. Because you are glad, because you are diligent, speaking to Babylon, O oh, you who pillage my heritage, my heritage, Israel. He says, because you skip around like a threshing he uh, heifer and <laughs> nay, like stallions, your mother will be greatly ashamed. She who gave you birth will be humiliated. Behold, she will be the least of the nations and a wilderness and a parched land and a desert. Because of the indignation of the Lord, she, Babylon, will not be inhabited, and she will be completely desolate. And everyone who passes by Babylon will be horrified, and they will hiss at all her wounds. Now you say, what is happening? I don't understand. Well, I wanted to bring you this far. Because what I wanted to show you is I wanted to show you that he is not talking about the destruction of Babylon by the Medes and the Persians. That destruction, you can read about the capture of the city in Daniel chapter 5. When Darius the Mede goes in, goes in through a tunnel and all of a sudden is standing in the room where Belteshazzar is and, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, he's the king at that time and he just takes him. He does not destroy the city. Now, Cyrus is the one that is really the head of the Medo-Persian Empire. Darius the Mede is under him. Cyrus is the one that's going to unite the Medes and the Persians. When you think of Persians, think of the area of Iran, the area of Elam. And so he's going to unite the Medes and the Persians. When Cyrus, and you need to remember this, when Cyrus un, under Darius the Mean goes in and takes Babylon, they do not destroy that city. They do not tear down the walls because he preserves the city. So when it's talking about Babylon being utterly desolate, we have to say, hey, wait a minute. What is going on? Explain this to me. And I'm going to explain it to you because if you understand it, then it will help you understand what you're reading here. You see, all of this was foretold, but then God begins to eventually, through time, reveal it and reveal it and reveal it. The Bible is a progressive revelation, and that's why you need to know the whole counsel of God. So this is what I want you to do. I want you next to verse uh, 11. It says, uh, verse 12, it says, Your mother will be greatly ashamed. Your mother, whose mother? Babylon's mother. She who gave you birth will be humiliated because of what is happening to you. So I just believe that what he's showing us is he's taking us back to the roots of Babylon. So I want you to go in your Bible to Genesis chapter 11. Now, while you're turning to Genesis chapter 11, let me just explain what is happening. In Genesis chapter 6, we find God disgusted with his creation because the uh, uh, thoughts and intents of man is only evil continually. So God brings a blub, 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 a flood. Remember Noah, remember the ark, and he brings a flood and he destroys all mankind except Noah, Mrs. Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and the Mrs. All right, then 
he causes that ark to land. And when he, it lands, then God removes the water from the face of the earth, and those people, Noah and his family, get off the ark. When they get off the ark, Noah has three sons. Now watch, uh, just think, right hand, Shem, head, Ham, left hand, uh, uh, um, Japheth. So he has three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. This is the way I do it when I teach Genesis. These are the nations. Now from Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the whole earth will be populated. So when they get off the ark and uh, uh, they are, uh, multiply and God tells them to be scattered and to fill the whole earth. Now from Shem will come Abraham. We find out about him in Genesis 12. From Ham will come Cush, and from Cush will come Nimrod. Now, Ham's the bad guy of the three sons because Ham sees his father naked and, and he doesn't cover his eyes. He doesn't honor his father. He doesn't respect his father. So God pronounces a curse on his child. All right, and so you have Shem, Ham, Japheth. You and I are from the line of Japheth. In Genesis chapter 10, you have the descendant of Ham is uh, Nimrod, who is a mighty hunter before the Lord. And it says in Genesis chapter 10, verse 10, hang on, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. The beginning of his kingdom was was Babel. Now, while Nimrod is not mentioned in Genesis chapter 11, because we know the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, we can take what happens in Genesis chapter 11 and put it together and understand the roots of Babylon. And what we come to is we come to the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11. We come to the Tower of Babel, and what they do is they build... A Remember this, a tower that reaches to heaven and they gather together because they don't want to be scattered over the earth. They want to make a name for themselves. They are not making God the habitation of righteousness. They are saying, God, we don't need you. We can reach from earth to heaven ourselves. Oh, beloved, don't miss the next study. So what is our precept for life today, beloved? You're going to appreciate it more tomorrow and the next day, but it is don't be arrogant against the Lord. Make God your habitation of righteousness, and if God tells you to do something, do it. Otherwise, you're going to get in trouble even as Babylon got in trouble. Well, let's look at Genesis chapter 11, verse 1. Now, the whole earth used the same language and the same words. And as they journeyed east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. You know where that is? That's in Babylon. It's in Babylon in that area where the Euphrates and the Tigris come together. And they said to one another, come and let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. Then they said, come and let us build for ourselves a city, a tower whose top reaches to the heavens. And then he says, and let us make for ourselves a name. You know, part of the problem in the United States of America is that we have people that are ungodly shepherds that are ruling a country that once had a fear of God and all they're interested in is making a name for themselves. He says, otherwise we will be scattered abroad over the whole earth. Well, that's what they were supposed to do. So the Lord comes down to see the city. And he says, behold, they are one people and they have the same language. And this is what they began to do. And now nothing which they purpose will become impossible for them. 
Come, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. In other words, they won't be able to pool their understanding and their talents and their resources. Therefore, so the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth. God's purposes stand. And they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. This, beloved, is the root of Babylon. And what you have to understand, there are two cities. There's Babylon, the city of man, and there's Jerusalem, the city of God. Where is your citizenship? Are you one of the world that wants to build your own tower? I'll get to heaven my way. I'll call what's right. I'll call what's wrong. God may tell me to do that, but I'm not going to do it. Oh, beloved, don't be deceived. Make him your habitation of righteousness.